we don't talk about Eddie Griffin enough. For Comedy Hype News, I'm Dom Smith. When it comes to discussing legends that have impacted comedy, that conversation cannot be had without mentioning Eddie Griffin. After starting comedy in the 80s in Kansas City, Missouri, it didn't take him long to make the trip to Los Angeles where he quickly became a regular at the world famous Comedy Store. Griffin's breakout moment came shortly after that when he appeared on HBO's Deaf Comedy Jam in 1992. Since then, Griffin has been making us laugh on stage, on the big screen, and even in the sitcom world. Griffin has been performing for nearly 40 years. Despite his longevity in the business, still not much is known about the man himself. He's an extremely private person, leaves his family life out of his act, and only shares what he feels is necessary. In a recent interview with Kevin Hart on the Comedy Gold Mines podcast, Griffin sat down with Hart to talk about Griffin's start in the business, share untold stories, and talk about comedy today. Here are some things you didn't know about Eddie Griffin. One of the first things Kevin Hart asked Eddie Griffin was how the show Malcolm and Eddie came to be. Griffin started the story off by explaining he never wanted a TV show in the first place because to him, TV felt constricting. Looking at Eddie Griffin's stand-up comedy act, it's not difficult to understand why he was uneasy. According to the interview, Griffin was performing at the House of Blues across the street from the comedy store in Los Angeles. He would often do an hour's worth of stand-up comedy, then perform with a band for an hour. The head of Sony Pictures was in attendance that night and immediately knew that Eddie Griffin deserved his own television show after seeing him perform. When executives brought Griffin in for a meeting, their one hesitation at the time was that Griffin did not have a Q factor. A Q factor in terms of show business is a measurement of the appeal of a company, celebrity, brand, or entertainment product. That factor is used to determine how popular a subject is. I was at William Morris Agency and they suggested me and Tupac. I'm like, that show would be canceled after two episodes. You can't have two volatile niggas on the show. Then they said Malcolm Jamal Warner. And I said, you talking about Theo? Eddie Griffin and Malcolm Jamal Warner met with each other to test out their chemistry and agreed to work together. Malcolm and Eddie debuted in August 1996 on UPN and lasted for a total of four seasons and 89 episodes produced. Griffin felt that the show had ended its run at the right time and ran its course as they began rehashing some old episode storylines from the first season. Griffin assured Hart that the two are still close to this day. Brett's lifetime batting average and Halle Berry's measurements. I know, I know, but I was at the liquor store, and you know how long them lines could get, and I dozed oh, up yeah. behind that Kool-Aid smile and that little fuzzy mustache lies a cold-blooded man-eating shark. In his interview with Kevin Hart, Griffin spoke on the relationship between himself and Eddie Murphy. During their conversation, Griffin revealed that Murphy got on the role as Anton Jackson, a.k.a. Undercover Brother. Universal had the script and they were thinking about doing a movie and they asked Eddie if he would do it and he said, no, this ain't me. This is Eddie Griffin. Eddie Murphy did that. I went in and I met with the producers, nailed the audition because I'm cool like that. In order to play Undercover Brother, you just got to be a naturally cool, calm, and collected dude. I'm the building! Ha, don't touch the fro! Back up off me! Back up off me! Let me tell you something about the word good. Slap! No! Slap! Are you trying to kill me? If you're going to pass in white America, you are going to have to learn to like mayonnaise. No. Griffin would then tell Hart that Murphy would sometimes stop by the comedy store when Griffin was first starting out. Griffin recalled that one night Murphy saw him perform and said, hey, you ready for the world, man? In a story that wasn't present during Kevin Hart's conversation with Eddie Griffin, it's also been revealed that Dave Chappelle suggested Griffin for a role in the film, A Star Is Born, co-written and directed by Bradley Cooper. This movie marked the first time that Chappelle and Griffin had reunited on the big screen since 2002's Undercover Brother. According to an interview in Vulture, Griffin explained how he ended up in the movie. Me and Dave Chappelle were at Charlie Murphy's funeral. I got up there and I got to preaching and I took over the church. After the service, Griffin, Chappelle, and George Lopez went out together. George says, I think you missed your calling. You're supposed to be a preacher. So Charlie Murphy's spirit is all over this. Here to take everybody money. Sim! 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 What y'all know about Sim? Pay me! Eddie Griffin has never been one to really talk about his personal life in his stand-up act. In this dialogue with Kevin Hart, Griffin got a little more personal and revealed that out of his five other siblings, it's just him and his little brother left. His mother lost four children. Griffin's older sister passed from breast cancer. Griffin's oldest brother was born in a set of triplets, and their family lost two out of the three. One passed shortly after their birth, and the other a week after. Eventually, the other brother would pass as well, but Griffin did not explain. 
Hart asked Griffin what role his younger brother played in Griffin's journey to success. Griffin simply said, I can't do it without him. In terms of his own family, Griffin has 11 kids. One of his daughters just got accepted to Syracuse University and his 12 year old son is a boxer. Griffin himself grew up without a father and made a promise to himself that if he ever had children, he would be the father that he never had. Hart asked Griffin, what sparked the move from Kansas City to Los Angeles? Griffin explained that he was a local celebrity and he had his own talk show at the time. Griffin's mother told him that he was a big fish in a small pond. He should move to either coast to see if he's a whale in the ocean. In Los Angeles, Griffin ended up staying with an uncle in Compton. But after the house was hit by a drive-by shooting, Griffin knew he couldn't live like that and moved out on his own with nowhere to go. Griffin stayed at the shelter for a while, but after a month, he got two jobs, one delivering pizza and the other doing security at his new hotel. Griffin ended up seeing an ad for the comedy store, called the club and tried to get some work for himself, but was turned away. Several minutes later, Griffin called the club once again, acting as if he was his own manager and was booked immediately. Griffin showed up to the comedy club, performed for five minutes, and was offered regular work at the comedy store. Griffin told the owner, Mitzi Shore, that he was homeless, and she got him a spot close by to call home. Martin is a genius. I had my first half hour HBO special. I was at the comedy store one night, Martin came up. Hey Ed, I got this new show Def Jam. Why don't you come do it? I said, I already got a half hour. What am I gonna do five minutes on Def Jam for? He's like, you're silly. Don't nobody know who you is. You do five minutes on Def Jam, blow the spot up, they're gonna be waiting to see your special. I said, this nigga's a genius. Griffin also told the story of his outfit choice for the first appearance on Def Jam. Griffin explained that so many people asked him why he decided to wear blue suede boots, a camouflage jacket with a big Jamaican hat. Everybody said New York is a tough crowd. They boo people. I said, cool, I'm gonna come out looking like the strangest nigga on earth. Before they knew what hit him, the jokes was lighting them up. When I walked out on stage, everybody was like, what kind of nigga is this? It's too late, I'm already in there. The Ronnie King beat and came on every night turned into a TV series. <laughs> well, let's watch the Rodney King beat tonight, 7.30, 8.30, 9.30 rule. Griffin said that by the time he did Michael Jackson on crack, it was already over. Mike was at home, Mike's like. Michael Jackson on crack still stands as one of the greatest jokes ever told on Def Comedy Jam 30 years later. He left the audience wanting more. It's difficult to follow a joke that memorable, but somehow Griffin was able to follow up with a career just as legendary. Stay up to date with the latest news in comedy by subscribing here to our YouTube channel, follow Comedy Hype across all social media, and look out for original content on our new streaming service at ComedyHype.com. For Comedy Hype News, I'm Dom Smith.